welcome friends and colleagues to Radcliffe Day 2015. I'm Liz Cohen, I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I am delighted that you are joining us uh, here in Cambridge and many people online. At Radcliffe, we often speak of being a big tent because of our commitment to generating and sharing ideas across the arts, humanities, sciences, and social sciences, and because we engage with everyone, from students to fellows to faculty to the broad public. Every other year, Big Tent is a metaphor. Today, here in Radcliffe Yard, we are literally in a big tent with all of you and it feels wonderful. So thank you for being here. Let me extend a special welcome to our former Radcliffe leaders, Deans Barbara Gross and Mary Maples Dunn. Drew Gilpin Faust is here in many capacities as the founding dean of the Radcliffe Institute, as the president of Harvard, and as last year's Radcliffe medalist. Other medalists joining us here today are Chief Justice Margaret Marshall and legal journalist Linda Greenhouse. So we can give them all a hand. We also welcome members of Radcliffe's Dean's Advisory Council and Schlesinger Library Council, Harvard's Governing Boards, the Harvard Alumni Association, and past members of the Radcliffe Alumni Association and Board of Trustees. And of course, the warmest of welcomes to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. I think you know she will receive the 2015 Radcliffe Medal today. And we are so pleased to be joined by her colleague and our special guest, Associate Justice David Souter. I would like to recognize the Radcliffe College alumni celebrating milestones this year including the reunion classes of 1945, 1950, 1955, maybe we'll give them all a hand at the end, 1960, 1965, 19 <laughs> 1970, and 1975, and all others celebrating reunions across the university. Please also join me in congratulating the earliest class in attendance today, 1940. Radcliffe College was founded in 1879 by visionaries who dared to imagine that women could and should undertake serious scholarly inquiry and contribute to the world of ideas and action. Nearly a century later, another visionary, Radcliffe President Mary Ingram Bunting, established what became the Bunting Institute to give exceptional women the resources they needed to reach new professional heights. Today, that bold Radcliffe spirit is alive and well. Scholars, scientists, and artists come from around the world, across the country, over the river from Boston, and up the street in, Radcliffe, in Harvard Yard to be part of the Radcliffe Institute. These women and men pursue new knowledge about the existence of extrasolar planets, the impact of religious communities on medieval architecture, the origins of human cooperation, the form and function of the brain, and how to put big data to work. They delve into the papers of ordinary and extraordinary women. They write ambitious novels and poetry collections. 
They improve pain management for children, investigate the future of navigation, and develop new approaches to addressing humanitarian crises. They work alone in the sanctuary of an office or in the Schlesinger Library's Fortzheimer reading room. They work together in research teams and writing groups. And they work with talented and curious Harvard undergraduates through the wonderful Radcliffe Research Partners Program. They produce new art. Along Brattle Street in the Wallach Garden, you can see a just unveiled installation by Christina Lee Jeros of the Graduate School of Design, who won our student public art competition. I, I urge you to return at night, uh, if you can, to see it in its full glory, brilliantly lit. In the Johnson Kulakundas Family Gallery in Byerly Hall, you can now see a tree as you've never seen one before from beneath the roots, and I invite you to go in there afterwards. And this fall, in front of Fay House, we'll be installing an inspiring new sculpture by Felicia Koshland, class of 1971. Throughout the year, we invite the public to listen, to learn, and to engage at all of our events that are free and incredibly diverse. Just to mention a few highlights, uh, this past year we've heard provocative remarks from the creator of the giant sugar sphinx in Brooklyn, artist Kara Walker, geologist David Montgomery, who explores the intersection of science and religion, Jay Smooth, the founder of New York's longest-running hip-hop radio show, and Major General Gina M. Grosso, the Director of Sexual Assault Prevention and Response for the United States Air Force. Videos of all these past events and many others are available online. But let's also look ahead. I invite you to return for a conference about Charlotte Perkins Gilman and her archives in June, for an exhibition about Sister Corita Kent in August, for a lecture by South African activist Dr. Mampila Rampili in September, and for a symposium about the future of DNA in October. And that's only a fraction of what's in store for the year ahead. The Institute's future looks bright not only because of the ideas that are illuminated here at the Institute, but also because the Radcliffe campaign is going very well. I'm pleased to tell you that we have now reached 63% of our $70 million goal for a total of $44 million. So far, 6,000 households have given to the Radcliffe campaign, and I'll let you applaud for that. I'm, I really am particularly proud of this widespread participation, and I thank you all for your generosity. With your ongoing support, Radcliffe will grow even stronger. What unites the Radcliffe community is a belief in inquiry, in exploration, and in innovation. This year's Radcliffe medalist is an individual whose life and work represent the values that Radcliffe was founded upon and continues to uphold today. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, has challenged and changed expectations throughout her life. Many of you may know that she was born and raised in Brooklyn. Some of you may have heard that her childhood name was Kiki. But few of you may be aware that she was an accomplished baton twirler in high school. Her pep squad was called the Go-Getters. And that is an apt description for a woman who graduated first in her class in high school, first in her class as an undergraduate at Cornell, and first in her class at Columbia Law School. Talk about a go-getter. <laughs> And Justice Ginsburg, in her college years, was more than studious. At Cornell, she became fast friends with the other women on her floor. They called themselves clobbage, 
an acronym of their first names, starting with the Kiki, Kiki as the K. That group of friends, six of them now, have gotten together as recently as last year. Well, not everyone has an acronym for their roommates. The tent today is filled with people who started friendships on college hallways and continue to stay connected and to be important to one another. For the women of Klobage, it would have been impossible to predict our world in which three women serve on the Supreme Court, a woman is the president of Harvard University, the CEOs of General Motors, IBM, and PepsiCo are women, a female former Secretary of State is running for president, the U.S. Armed Forces includes four women who have attained four-star rank, and half the junior faculty hired this year at Harvard are women. The first time gender parity. <laughs> the first time gender parity has been reached across the university. These developments might not have been easily foreseen, but many of you here today in different ways and at different moments helped make them happen. And we are here today to honor how one person, our honoree, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, knocked on closed doors, opened them, and then held them open for others. When Justice Ginsburg graduated from Columbia Law School, it seemed unlikely she would get a clerkship despite her class rank. And if you were here this morning, you heard Michael Klarman tell this story, but I'm gonna tell it again because it's such a good one. It wasn't just that she was a woman, but she was also a mother. Who would hire her? Professor Jerry Gunther, then on the Columbia faculty, recommended Justice Ginsburg to many, many judges. He even promised these prospective employers that if she didn't work out, he would find a male lawyer to replace her. With that promise, Justice Ginsburg was finally hired by Judge Edmund Palmieri of the Southern District. And how did it go? So successfully that the next clerk hired by Judge Palmieri was also a woman. Justice Ginsburg uh, then opened other doors in other ways. As the co-founder of the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU, she challenged inequality by changing laws piece by piece, case by case working with and for everyday people to address everyday injustices. She won five of the six cases she brought to the Supreme Court. Her victories led to important improvements in the lives of women and men and their families, such as securing social security benefits for fathers, obtaining spousal benefits for women in the military, and eliminating gender-based jury service exemptions in part by arguing that optional jury duty for women treats women's service on juries as less valuable than men's and threatens women's right to trial by a jury of their peers. Beginning in 1980, Ruth Bader Ginsburg served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Some feared that she, a passionate advocate before the courts, would intensify what was already a highly polarized court. Again, she defied expectations. She was partial to impartiality. She sought clarity and consistency in the important work of the appeals court. As a judge, she demonstrated a commitment not to generating heat, but to shedding light. When President Clinton appointed Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the Supreme Court in 1993, she joined Sandra Day O'Connor as only the second woman on the court in its history. It was an institution so male that a popular history of the court uh, was entitled The Brethren. The National Association of Women Judges, an organization whose papers we are grateful to have in Radcliffe Schlesinger Library, and whose membership is very well represented here today, brilliantly underscored the point by giving Justice O'Connor a t-shirt that read, I'm Sandra, not Ruth, and Justice Ginsburg gets made, I'm Ruth, not Sandra. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg was hardly intimidated. 
or if she was, no one who observed her asking questions from the bench, engaging with colleagues, or issuing decisions could detect it. A selection of majority opinions she wrote includes illuminating the ban on women at the Virginia Military Institute, enabling a parent to try to regain custody of her children despite her inability to pay court fees, strengthening the power of the federal EPA to enforce the Clean Air Act, defending the rights of people with mental disabilities to live in community settings and not be institutionalized, upholding the right of a death penalty defendant to turn to the United States Supreme Court as a court of last resort, and shielding citizens from unreasonable search and seizure. A dozen years ago, Justice Ginsburg was part of the majority opinion allowing race to be a factor in law school admissions in recognition that discrimination lives on in America despite our hopes and ideals to the contrary. While some in the majority forecast that race-based considerations would surely not be relevant 25 years after the decision, Justices Ginsburg and Breyer took a less sanguine view. These days, their doubts seem all too prescient. Even when Justice Ginsburg was not in the majority, she shapes the way we live and work. For example, in the Lilly Ledbetter equal pay case, the majority decision in practice allowed pay discrimination to continue indefinitely. When Justice Ginsburg delivered her dissent, she charged Congress with correcting her colleagues' interpretation of the law. Within about 18 months, which is record speed in our system of government, Congress passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, and it was signed into law by President Obama. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg's accessible, incisive decisions and powerful dissents have challenged assumptions and changed actions. What animates all her opinions is an unqualified commitment to fairness and a willingness to grapple with what the founder's vision of equality means today. In addition to shaping law, public policy, and public opinion, our honoree is in full bloom as a cultural icon. She, or rather a diva who will be performing as Justice Ginsburg, will soon star in the opera Scalia Ginsburg, recent, <laughs> recently written by Derek Wang, Harvard class of 2006. It's not only the first opera about the highest court in our land, but it, is, it also has more footnotes than any other libretto. <laughs> in fact, one aria, sung by Justice Ginsburg, or the diva, is annotated with 50 footnotes. Now, that's a lot, but given that the aria is sung to Justice Scalia, and it is called, You, Sir, Are Wrong Here, <laughs> that is perhaps fewer footnotes than one might expect. You need not be an opera connoisseur to appreciate Justice Ginsburg's place in our culture today. She is a pop icon. While staying on the bench, she has also moved onto Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, t-shirts, mugs, you name it, even Halloween. Kids all across America, not just in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Washington, DC, are dressed as Just Justice Ginsburg for trick-or-treating. The most popular image online was of a baby with the earrings, the glasses, the robe, and a certain steely look. <laughs> I don't know how our honoree feels about this level of fame, but I hope she takes enormous pleasure, as we all should, in the fact that the baby who won this Halloween contest, dressed as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was a boy. That, like so many of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's extraordinary accomplishments, is a sign of the progress she has achieved for women, for men, and for the fundamental principle of making equity and fairness a reality for all. 
We will hear from Justice Ginsburg shortly when she engages in conversation with Kathleen Sullivan, a brilliant litigator and constitutional scholar who has been on the faculties of Harvard Law School and Stanford Law School, where she was also dean. Kathleen is a partner in the firm that some refer to as Quinn Emanuel, but we prefer to call by its full name, Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan. And we are delighted and grateful to have Kathleen Sullivan join us today. But first, join me in welcoming Justice David Souter to the podium. He served on the Supreme Court from 1990 to 2009, including more than 15 years alongside Judge Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg. When we asked Justice Souter to speak about his professional and personal regard for Justice Ginsburg, he said we were honoring him, and I quote, munificently. Now, with a vocabulary like that, do I even need to say that he was a Harvard graduate uh, of the college, and he's also a graduate of Harvard Law School. Justice Souter honors us all and Justice Ginsburg munificently by joining us here today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Dean Cohen and members of the, of the hierarchy today, Justice Ginsburg and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be saying gentlemen, but as I look out over the audience, I realize that this idea of Ruth's of gender equality seems to have caught on here. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. As the, as the dean suggested, I'm, I'm uh, rather a transitional figure here today, and I'm not going to try, I was, I was not uh, authorized to try to recap either, either Justice Ginsburg's litigating experience uh, or the substance of, of, of her decisions. Uh, I, I was asked, at least as best I could figure it out, to, to basically provide some personal atmosphere uh, that at least would, would be consistent with what you've been uh, hearing and probably will hear a bit more of before the, uh, before the afternoon is over. And in, uh, in, in trying to find some way to, to sum up some of the atmospherics that I, I want to get into, uh, I thought of a, a perfect quotation from Learned Hand. And those, those of you here who are not judges and lawyers, uh, I assume there are some, uh, uh, need, need to know only that Learned Hand uh, was one of the most eminent judges in the Anglo-American tradition. He was on the United States Court of Appeals for the uh, Second Circuit, which is based in, in New York. Uh, and one thing leads to another. Once I, I thought of the hand quote that I wanted to work into my remarks, I started thinking of, of other things by and about Learned Hand. And I'm going to start with a story that he used to tell about himself. Uh, he told it in, in more than one place, and there, there are different versions of it, but this is, this is the basic story. It's, it's a story of his fantasy of, of his first day in heaven. Uh, and in, in the morning, uh, there is, there's, there's a baseball game. Uh, and um, uh, it turns out that, that uh, it's bottom of the ninth, and, and hands... Uh, Han's team uh, has not had a run. The opposing team has had three. But the bases are loaded, and Hand is up at bat, and he, he hits a hummer. And all four come in, and of course, he is idolized as the, as the hero of the morning. And, and after lunch that day, uh, there, is a, there is a football game. Uh, and uh, as Hand would tell the story, 
Uh, it was the, the fourth quarter with three minutes left to play, and, and the, the game was scoreless. And somehow back on about the 30-yard line, Han got the ball, and he miraculously made his way down across the goal line. And of course, the, the company of heaven simply erupted uh, in, in rapture at what he had done. And that evening, the crowning event of the day was, uh, was a formal dinner uh, for the great philosophical intellects of all time. Uh, and, and Plato was there, Aristotle was there, uh, Aquinas, uh, Descartes, Leibniz, Locke, Hume, Berkeley. Uh, and the speaker for the evening uh, uh, was Voltaire. And uh, so uh, the, the time came, and, and uh, Voltaire got up and, and began his remarks. And as he spoke, though, the, 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 the great thinkers there began to look around a little bit, and they noticed that their, their newest member, Hand, was there. And, and the audience began to become a little bit restive. And after a while, murmuring was heard. And finally, the murmuring gave way to, to sort of outspoken comment. And somebody yelled, shut up, Voltaire. Uh, and another person got up and said, sit down, Voltaire. We want to hear from hand. <laughs> well, I realize that as the man who is standing between you and hearing Justice Ginsburg <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I know the spot that Voltaire was in, uh, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to rely on, on your indulgence for a few minutes to help me get, get out of the spot that I'm in uh, by, by letting, me, letting me tell you uh, a, uh, a little bit about the sort of the, the drive uh, that lies behind, the drive and the personality that lies behind uh, Justice Ginsburg's extraordinary accomplishments. Uh, what I'm really, I guess, going to do is, is sort of give you some tips for things to, to look for and listen for uh, behind what she is saying this afternoon. And my first tip for you is um, uh, don't be fooled uh, by the formalities of professional discourse that will probably go on betwixt her and, and, uh, and Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, don't be fooled because uh, along with uh, an extraordinary and unfailing natural courtesy, Justice Ginsburg uh, seems to, to uh, find it compatible to have uh, sort of an enormous store of the of the gumption to to speak up uh, and 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 to speak out, and you would you would expect this simply from what you already know about her, and and you will certainly uh, expect it the more after you you hear from her. But I'm just going to give you uh, a, a couple of stories that that uh, that illustrate that fact to to set it in your mind. Uh, and uh, the, the, the first of them takes me back to the very first morning that I sat on the bench of the Supreme Court uh, with Justice Ginsburg back in, in October of 1993. And uh, because she was, the, uh, she was the newest justice, she, she was uh, sitting to my left on the bench. And to my right was, uh, was uh, her friend and my friend, Justice Scalia. Now, you have to understand that, that both Justice Scalia and I tend to be active questioners of the lawyers who are arguing before us. Uh, uh, we, we want to get the arguments to the issues that are troubling us about which we have questions uh, that, that go to the case of the, of the lawyer who is arguing, and we, we try to get right to it. And I can tell you that that morning, uh, neither Justice Scalia nor I uh, was, was expecting any serious competition from the newcomer uh, in, in interrogating the lawyers. Uh, but we were in for a big surprise. Uh, Justice Ginsburg was off the mark with the first question before Justice Scalia and I uh, had our mouths open. And not, not only that, 
but she kept it up. And every time he or I would get ready to ask a question, there'd be another one from the junior member of the court. And finally, after, after a couple of minutes of, of, of frustrated silence, uh, Justice Scalia leaned over to me and whispered, and he said, you and I may have asked our last questions in this courtroom. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that he and I became somewhat more nimble uh, over the years, and we were, we were able to get in a, in a few of our own. And uh, I'll, 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 tell you, I'll tell you another, another story that, uh, of, of something that has not happened to me very, very often, but it has happened. Justice Ginsburg and I, uh, so far as statistics go, uh, in our years together, tended to come out with a very high uh, degree of, of, uh, of, of, of frequent agreement, uh, but not always. Uh, and I can tell you uh, that if you are dissenting from an opinion of Justice Ginsburg's, or she is dissenting from an opinion of yours, the only thing for you to do is to cancel all other plans for the near future because you are going to be at it for a long time. Justice Ginsburg, to, to adapt a phrase that has become common, Justice Ginsburg is a tiger justice. Uh, uh, those, two, those two qualities of, of, uh, uh, of, of sort of intellectual initiative and, and both intellectual and, and emotional stamina uh, are the qualities that made me think of that quotation from Learned Hand that I alluded to before. They are the qualities that go into the making uh, of a great justice. And a great justice is what Justice Ginsburg is. And Learned Hand uh, was, uh, was, was lecturing once a good many years ago over at the law school. Uh, and he was describing why it was uh, that he still revered uh, the professors who had taught him law there. And this is the phrase he used to sum up. In the universe of truth, they lived by the sword. Well, so does Justice Ginsburg. And in addition to doing that, uh, there, is, there is a grace that also uh, must be noted. Uh, uh, you're going to like her. <laughs> uh, when, when, I was, when I was thinking of what I might say uh, this afternoon, uh, I went to my file cabinet and I pulled out the notes that I had made of the, the arguments and, and, and our discussions of the cases that, that first week that she sat with us back in 1993. And my notes uh, for the latter part of the week included this statement, and I quote myself, I can't preserve caution in my delight with Ruth. Get, uh, get yourselves ready to feel the same way. Uh, lunch, is, lunch is behind us, and we are now going to have a feast in the company of Justice Ginsburg and, and of Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, uh, it's, it's what Learned Hand might have called a double henna. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I have I have known uh, Ms. Sullivan uh, both in her capacity as a lecturer uh, and in her capacity as, as a law school dean. Uh, I know her accomplishments as a professor, uh, and I can tell you that she honors all of us by joining with us to help us honor Ruth Ginsburg today. And as I, as I make my way for, uh, make, make way for the, for the two of them, uh, let me just ask you to remember one thing. You're going to be hearing them for maybe half an hour. 
I have known and listened to each of them for a good many years. You're never going to forget them. And you're always going to envy me. <laughs> Good afternoon, and Dean Cohen, Justice Souter, Justice Ginsburg, marvelous and distinguished alumni of Radcliffe, many classes strong. It is such a deep honor and personal privilege for me to conduct this conversation with Justice Ginsburg. You've heard a great deal about her life today from her days at Harvard Law School, a stone's throw away from here through her career as a lawyer, to her time as Tiger Justice, to her being the star of an opera, Scalia Ginsburg, and known in rap circles as Notorious RBG. <laughs> but I would like to take us back to something that has been alluded to in this morning's marvelous panel, your life as a lawyer. It's no secret to those who practice before the Supreme Court and follow the Supreme Court that Justice Ginsburg is not just a judge's judge, a justice's justice. She is a lawyer's lawyer, the one who writes perhaps the most of the civil procedure cases, and who forged a career as a brilliant litigator for the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU back in the early 70s. At a time when there was no Equal Rights Amendment, no update to the words of the Constitution in the 14th Amendment in 1868 that said that no state shall deprive any person of equal protection of the laws, but no clear extension of that principle to the principle of sex equality. Justice Ginsburg, more than anyone else, forged that development in the law. And Justice Ginsburg, I wonder if we could start by going back to the 70s and hearing you talk about the turning point cases the case of Reed v. Reed that you worked on, or Frontiero versus Richardson. Can you take us back and tell us about those cases? Kathy, before I do that, let me say uh, that I, I don't think there's ever been a higher note than there was this morning. I'm with my dear colleague, Justice Souter. I've loved it all, and I hope you have enjoyed it. And I just would like to add a PS to something my colleague said. In the years we served together, Justice Souter and I voted alike more than any two other justices, even more than Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas. <laughs> I miss him, but I have, I occupy the chambers that were his when he was on the court. Now, they look a little different. <laughs> <laughs> but I think of him uh, with great appreciation for what a wonderful colleague he was. Anyway, Sally Reed. So Sally Reed is a woman from Boise, Idaho. And she has had a tragic occurrence in her life. Sally was childless for 10 years, and then she and her husband adopted a, a baby boy. And then they had a falling out, so they separated. And the young boy was given to Sally as primary custodian because the child was what the law called of tender years. When the boy reached his teens, father applied for custody. His argument was, now the boy needs to be prepared for a man's world. The judge said yes. Sally opposed it. She thought the father would not be a good influence on the boy, and sadly, she proved to be right. One day, the boy was sorely depressed, and he took out one of his father's many guns, and he committed suicide. 
So Sally wanted to be appointed administrator of his estate. The probate court judge told her, I'm sorry, Sally, but the law is clear. The Idaho Probate Code says, as between people equally entitled to administer a decedent's estate, males must be preferred to females. So it was the perfect statute to attack as discriminating, discriminating arbitrarily against a woman. But what Sally Reed's case brought home to me is that this is a woman who was hardly sophisticated. She probably didn't count herself a feminist. She probably didn't even know what the word meant. But she thought that she had suffered an injustice and that the legal system could make it right. I don't know how many countries that would be so. So Sally went through three levels of the Idaho courts. She lost the first time, won the second time, and lost the third time. The Supreme Court heard her case, and for the first time in the history of that court, they said that a gender classification violated the principle of the equal protection of the laws. And that was quite remarkable because the Equal Rights Amendment, which had been uh, enacted in Congress numerous times but never ratified by the states, was not yet in force. So you had to make new law with the existing language of the Constitution. How did you do that? How, how did you convince them that the law in Idaho was irrational to discriminate between men and women? Well, we went through every equal protection decision. There weren't that many outside of the race area and picked up the best language of, uh, that we could find. And it was just the, the life story of this woman and the arbitrariness of the law. Now the law, it, it was understandable because it was copied um, by Idaho from California. It was a middle 19th century law. The thinking was that women, once they married, lose the right to contract in their own names, sue and be sued in their own names, hold property. So all things considered, if you had a choice between a man who was competent and a woman who was under these law-imposed disabilities, you would prefer the man. Now, a number of the laws that you challenged during this absolutely pivotal period with the ACLU Women's, Legal, uh, Women, Women's Rights Project were actually laws that gave apparent privileges to women over men. Laws that assumed that military wives were dependent on their service members' husbands' income, or social security classifications that assumed that Wives were dependent on husbands, but husbands would have to prove dependency to get benefits earned by their wives. So you might say these were laws that were sex discrimination, but nominally in favor of women. And yet you took those on as well in cases like Frontiero and later in cases like Weisenfeld. Can you tell us a little bit about why you challenged on behalf of men some of these apparent privileges for ladies? The object was to get at the stereotype that held women back from doing whatever their talent would allow them to do. The notion was that there were separate spheres for the sexes. Men were the doers in the world of commerce, and women were the stay-at-home types who looked after the hearth and the children. And what we were trying to accomplish was to get rid of all laws based on that stereotype so people, women as well as men, could be, in the words of a song popular in the early 70s, free to be you and me. <laughs> Stephen Weisenfeld's case, um, again, it was a tragic circumstance. 
He was married to a high school math teacher. And their division at home was he was the principal homebody. She was the principal earner. She had a healthy pregnancy. She was teaching into her ninth month. Went to the hospital to give birth. The doctor came out and told Stephen, you have a healthy baby boy, but your wife died of an embolism. Mm. So Stephen vowed that he would be the caregiving parent. He would not work full time until his child was in school full time. And he could manage that, he thought, by what were called child and care social security benefits. He could earn up to the earnings limit, what he earned plus the social security. He could manage to care for his child and himself. So he went to the Social Security office to ask for these child in care benefits and was told, uh, this is the statute. You see, it says mother's benefits. They weren't available to a father. And how the case began, Stephen wrote a letter to the editor of his local newspaper in Edison, New Jersey. The letter said, I have been hearing a lot about women's lib. Let me tell you my story. And the tagline after he said, I don't get these benefits as a parent. It makes no sense. Does Gloria Steinem know about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, someone who was on the Spanish faculty at, at Rutgers University and a friend called me and said, this isn't right, is it? So I said, suggest that, that Stephen Weisenfeld called the New Jersey affiliate of the ACLU. Mm -hmm. And we took that case from the district court to the Supreme Court. I'm very proud of this because we got the decision from the Supreme Court before Jason, the baby, turned three. And that's record. <laughs> Really record. <laughs> anyway, it, it was a unanimous judgment, but they divided three ways on who was the victim of the discrimination. The majority said, of course, it's the wage earning woman. She pays the same social security taxes as a man pays, but the government doesn't give her family the same protection it would give to a man's family. And then it was discrimination, a couple of them thought, against the male as parent, because he wouldn't have the opportunity to be the personal primary caregiver of his child. And then there was one who later became my chief, who said, totally arbitrary from the point of view of the baby. Why should the baby have the opportunity for the care of a sole surviving parent only when that parent is female, not male? People were astonished because it was the first time that then Justice Rehnquist had ever found a law offensive to the equal protection principle. <laughs> So that was a, a remarkable decision to have it come down unanimously. And it was a way of saying that uh, a law that seems to give women special privileges and protections can actually be discriminatory, discriminatory against women wage earners and service members, discriminatory against the men who are playing the role of parent or caretaker of the children after a spouse has died. And it creates these stereotypes. And that's no doubt what led Justice Brennan in his concurrence in the Frontiero case that you won so spectacularly to say that what looks like being put on a pedestal may sometimes be a cage, imprisoning women in old stereotypes. So between Reed and Frontiero and uh, Weisenfeld, you really laid the groundwork for the law that started to break down those old, archaic, and outmoded stereotypes. But I'd like to ask you if you could talk a bit about this. What was the role of popular opinion or the evolving social consensus in those decisions? It made all the difference. The litigation in the 70s would have been impossible in the 60s. 
And let me give you an example. Jury duty was mentioned this morning. There was a case in 1961, these were the years of the quote, liberal Warren court. The case involved Gwendolyn Hoyt. Today we would call her a battered woman. She one day had been humiliated to the breaking point by her philandering abusive husband. She turned to the corner of the room and there was her young son's baseball bat. And she took it and hit her spouse over the head. He fell against the stone floor. End of their altercation. <laughs> Beginning of the murder prosecution. This occurred in Hillsborough County, Florida. And in those days, women were not on the jury rolls. They could come, come to the clerk's office and sign up, but otherwise they weren't there. And so Sally Reed was tried before an all-male jury, and she had the notion, not that she would necessarily have been acquitted were there women on the jury, but the choice between murder and manslaughter, women on the jury might have swung it to the lesser crime of manslaughter. Mm -hmm. She was convicted of murder by an all-male jury. And when her case got to the Supreme Court in 1961, the view was, we don't understand this complaint. Women have the best of both worlds. They can sign up if they want to. But if they don't want to serve, they don't have to. Hmm. The point that her lawyers tried to make before the Supreme Court was, Keeping women off the jury rolls says something about how the state regards its citizens. Citizens have obligations as well as rights. And one obligation is to be part of the administration of justice. So a law that says women aren't on juries unless they volunteer is saying the women are expendable. We don't need them in this justice system. Yes, if they want to, we'll allow them. The men, on the other hand, are essential, so we can't give them <laughs> exemptions from, from jury duty. That was Wendell and Hoyt's case in 1961. There was a sea change in attitude by the 70s. More and more women were in the workforce. It became increasingly easier to control a, a woman to control her reproductive capacity. People were living longer. And there was a quite a high degree of inflation. So the two earner family became uh, the, the ideal. It was that change that had already occurred in society that led the court at last to catch up Mm -hmm. to that change. And I, I, I think it's worth stopping to note how remarkable it is that you won those sex discrimination cases in the early 70s, just a decade after the Supreme Court had refused to find it discrimination to keep women off the jury polls. So that's a remarkable change in a short amount of time, due very much to advocacy as well as social evolution. But you famously said once that the court can't get out too far ahead of social consensus and popular opinion. And maybe the nation had, might have needed some more time to percolate before Roe versus Wade was decided. How do we know when popular opinion and social consensus has come far enough? What do we look to? Well, it wasn't so much that Roe was ahead of its time. It's really the way the court decided it. It mm -hmm. was an unusual decision in this respect. In one fell swoop, the court made unconstitutional every abortion law in the country. Even the most liberal states didn't satisfy uh, the standards set in that case. So the court had done it all. And the people who were advocating for a woman's ability to control her own destiny they retired while the opposition mounted. Now they had, instead of having to fight in the trenches state by state, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, 
they had this one single target to aim at, this, this decision. It would have been an easy thing to do to declare the Texas law that was in front of the court unconstitutional because the only ground for abortion in Texas at that time was the life of the woman, not her health. Her health could be devastated, didn't matter, just her life. That was too extreme, and the court could have said that, put down its pen, and then let the political system react to that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the nature of the decision and the rate of change is just as important as the country's readiness for change. Well, maybe we could fast forward now to the time you had on the bench. I mean, you had the remarkable privilege of not only arguing as an advocate and winning some of the most important sex discrimination cases in our nation's history. You then, sitting on the court, had the chance to author some of them. And I wonder if you could share with us maybe some observations about writing the opinion for the court in the Virginia Military Institute case, which held that women couldn't be excluded from a public military institute, and not even if there was another school for girls nearby. Perhaps I should start with a case that was 20 years earlier. Um, it was Susan Vorchheimer's case against the Philadelphia Board of Education. There were two high schools for gifted children in Philadelphia. The names of the schools, I think, tell the story. One was Girls High, and the other was Central High. <laughs> A young girl, noticing the difference between these two schools, said, I don't want to go to the girls' high. I want to go to the central high, where they have better science and math facilities, um, a much better library, of course, infinitely better sports facilities. So she uh, started her case in the federal district court, and she won went up on appeals, and the Court of Appeals reversed two to one. She petitioned for cert, and the Supreme Court split four to four. And that means you automatically affirm the decision of the court one step below, write no opinion, has no presidential value. So the federal courts were evenly divided, um, with two in the lower courts on each side, and the Supreme Court fought it for. Uh, I had written in the brief in the Vorchheimer case, but it was argued by local counsel. And when the VMI decision came out, my dear husband said to me, well, Ruth, it took you 20 years to win the Vorchheimer case, but you finally did it. <laughs> <laughs> but the change in the time is interesting because the name of the VMI case is United States against Virginia. So it was our government urging that no public institution could exclude on the basis of gender the government taking up the claim of the women who wanted to be admitted to VMI. Some people said to me about the VMI case, well, why would, why would women want to go to that school with its rat line and frigidity? And I said, well, I wouldn't want to. <laughs> and perhaps you, a man, would not want to either. But there are some women who see that as the right place for them and who are fully equipped to survive the rigorous regime. Why should they be held back? Simply because they are women. And so the, um, the VMI case was very satisfying in many ways. For one thing, the VMI faculty was very much in favor of the admission of women. The reason should be obvious. If they could include women in their applicant pool, they would upgrade the quality of their <laughs> students. <laughs> well,
Well, that was a, a, a remarkable decision and uh, one of many important ones you wrote on the court. I wish we had more time to talk about all of them, but maybe we could talk a bit more broadly about the court itself and about the collegiality that we saw on such magnificent display today with Justice Souter's remarks about you and your remarks in duet with him about how much you enjoyed being his colleague. But the two of you did agree quite a bit. But we understand there's an opera called Scalia Ginsburg <laughs> that discusses some of the disagreements between you and Justice Scalia. And yet, you're great friends. And you go to the opera together. And you have collegiality that I think you've described as being true of all the members of the court. So how can it be that as the closing duet in Scalia Ginsburg goes, you can be on the court with people who say to each other, as you and Scalia are said to sing to each other, we are different, we are one. How does that work? <laughs> I'd like to explain first why this opera is called Scalia Ginsburg, because some of my feminist colleagues have said, you come first alphabetically. Why shouldn't it be Ginsburg? <laughs> and so I explain that in the United States Supreme Court, seniority is very important. So Scalia is appointed in the 80s. So he's a few steps ahead of Ginsburg. By seniority, it's Scalia Ginsburg. Well, the, the closing aria is what it portrays is we, we have different views on how our Constitution should be interpreted. But we, we revere the court, and we want to make sure that we don't do any damage to it. So different in our views, but one in our reverence for the federal judicial system. Well, uh, do you want to tell people how the opera opens, what the differences oh, yeah, are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the opera is borrowed from many long dead composers, long dead because there are no copyright problems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Scalia's opening aria is Handelian. It's a rage aria. And it goes this way. The justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this, the Constitution said absolutely nothing about, about this. <laughs> and if you'd like to know about my answering aria. Yes, please. It, it, it is. Um, dear Nino, you are searching for bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. but. The great thing about our Constitution, it can evolve. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the, the most important scenes, and I'm eager to see this performed, is Justice Scalia has been locked up in a dark room being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> <laughs> and I come to his rescue, entering through a glass ceiling. <laughs> well, I think that's a fitting note on which to end our conversation because a very important next step has to occur, the award of the Radcliffe Medal. There isn't a glass ceiling you haven't broken, Justice Ginsburg. As brilliant professor, as originator of an entire line of scholarship on gender discrimination, as brilliant lawyer, all without role models. There weren't women federal judges before 1949. And then, of course, as the second woman justice on the Supreme Court, and a great justice. Thank you for the inspiration you have given to all of us who are privileged to have benefited from the pathways you have forged in the law. And let me just close by asking you to say one last thing about what you'd say to the young women of today. If so much could change in your career and through your career, 
What do you think is the most inspirational message you have for them? Young women today have this great advantage is that there are no doors, no more closed doors. We didn't, that was basically what the 70s were about, opening doors that had been closed to women. So my advice, what is my advice is, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. That is one vital asset is a sense of humor. <laughs> so I don't know how many put downs I have turned that way. It was, the, the remark was made about then Justice Rehnquist saying at the end of the Missouri jury case, so, Mrs. Ginsburg, you won't settle for Susan B. Anthony's face on the new dollar. Now, the perfect answer, which I didn't think of on the spot, <laughs> would have been, and no, uh, Justice Rehnquist, tokens won't do. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to Justice Ginsburg, and I'll turn things back over to Dean Cohen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I will speak, I think, for for everyone in this room, in this tent, to say, to thank Kathleen Sullivan for uh, being such a spectacular teacher, as, as Justice Souter told us you are, and for being part of another Radcliffe Day. You were on a panel when we gave the Radcliffe Medal to Margie Marshall. And for sharing your intelligence, your wit, your charm with us. Um, we have seen today that you can ask questions as impressively as you can answer them. And we are very grateful to you for both. So thank you. And of course, to Justice Ginsburg, thank you for giving us such a marvelous day. You so generously shared your time, your insights, and your wisdom. It, has now, it is now the moment to confer on you the 2015 Radcliffe Medal. Here is the citation. She is a passionate advocate for equality and a dispassionate jurist for justice. Whether in the majority or the minority, she illuminates a path toward the society of greater fairness and dignity. She elevates the work of the court by respecting her opponents while holding steadfast to her convictions. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I bestow upon you this Radcliffe Medal with the deepest of admiration for a lifetime of brilliant service. Thank you. Thank you.